Good morning all. Uh, my name is Patil. So this is a, a Spark introduction. So introduction to Spark, why we need to learn Spark and what is the need of uh, learning Spark. Okay, before, before going to Spark, uh, let's have a, a quick overview of uh, traditional uh, application, how we generally work on traditional application and also let's see how Hadoop is working, how MapReduce is working. Then we jump into Spark, why Spark and what are the problem with the MapReduce. Okay. So, uh, traditional approach, if you see here, uh, we have a relational database. It can be a Oracle database or it can be MySQL database, any relational database which uh, follows ACID properties. And we have a centralized system which can be a Java application or .NET application or any, uh, any web application or enterprise application. And here is the user. User, you can be uh, developed by using JavaScript, AngularJS, anything. So, this is how uh, a traditional three-tier application works. So if you have worked on Java or .NET, uh, you will be knowing more about this. So it's a relational database you can sh where we store the data. And this is a uh, centralized system where we uh, write our own uh, Java, Java logic or .NET logic, uh, Spring or EJB, anything which can be enterprise level or at an application level. So then it is the user who see the code, who see the UI basically, so which will have a text box and UI kind of thing. So for example, Citibank application, so which follows this kind of thing, this kind of architecture. What is it, right? So what is happening every, after every 18 months, after every 18 months data is doubled. So as of now, uh, assume that the whatever the data we have, so which is there here. So after 18 months what is happening, the data is doubled. So after again 18 months the data is doubled. Assume that entire world, world has a 1000 GB of data. So after 18 months what is happening, it becoming 2000, 2000 GB. Again after 18 months again, 4000 GB. So, uh, so even if you store that amount of data, we cannot process 
uh, using the same application. So what we have to do, we have to change this application and also this application and this application. The entire architecture has to be changed if you want to process huge amount of data that is called big data. So that is a problem. You cannot store that amount. Even if, if for after 18 months the data is doubled, you can okay, you can store it. Okay, after after 18 months if the data is doubled again, you can store it. But you cannot process the same amount of data by using the same application. Data is increasing, data is increasing, data is increasing. But we have the same traditional processing engine. So it is called a storage engine and it is called a processing engine, and we store we show it to users. That's a three-part web application works, which can be developed by using Java, .NET, with the elite uh, relational database of Oracle or uh, MySQL, any any database. So what what uh, Hadoop suggest? What Hadoop came there is a lot of history behind it. So what Hadoop suggest? Instead of storing it in one machine, Hadoop suggest to store it in n machine, n number of machine. That is called cluster. So there are a lot of different uh, data sources. For example, uh, social media data sources or system log data source or relational data source and instead of storing in one machine what I'm doing I'm storing it in three machines here. So that is called as a cluster. So and instead of processing by using single processing engine which I used to do by using Java or .NET or any application. So we store uh, we process a par by using parallel processing engine called MapReduce. So instead of storing in one machine I'm storing in three machines that is called distributed storage. We call in Hadoop this called HDFS Hadoop distributed file system. And instead of processing by using single processing engine, we process parallelly. That is called MapReduce. That is how the Hadoop suggests. Don't store it in one machine. Rather than storing in one machine, Hadoop suggests store it in 10 machines or 15 machines. That is called cluster. Could you take any doubt here? No. Okay. So what, what is it? Uh, Hadoop distributed file system looks like this. So uh, this is one rack, this is one more rack. We can assume that this is an eight node cluster or nine node cluster. One is a name node, one machine is a name node and remaining are the data nodes. <coughs> so what, what Hadoop distributed file system says, don't store your file in one machine, rather you store the file and you break down your file and store it in n number of machines. For example, data.csv is the one file. Let's assume this is a 130, 130 MB file. So the block size is 64 MB. So for each block, one block will be stored in one machine. So one, 138 MB will be divided into three machines. So three blocks basically. So so how many machines? Yeah, for example, one uh, CSV is 138 MB, 130 MB file. So my block size is 64. That is by, by default. So how many blocks will be there? Three blocks, right? So one block with one machine, one block in another machine, one block in another machine. So what, that's a uh, HDFS suggest. Don't store it in one machine, rather you store the entire file in a three different machine. That's how the distributed file system works. So even if one node fails, then you can uh, retrieve V1 from uh, this IRAC2 and Node 2. So anybody has doubt in this HDFS? You, I think you guys are working on Hadoop or uh, learning Hadoop, right? So if you have any doubts here, you can ask me. So name node is the person who is the master node who stores the metadata information where the files are stored or basically blocks are stored, how the blocks are stored. Data is split into different blocks. For me it is one, one, one file, but internally it is stored in three different data nodes. They are, they are called slave nodes. How the data is stored? Data is stored in blocks, right? Right? So if I have a, a 200 MB uh, and a 64 is the block size, how many blocks will be there? Three blocks, 200 MB, uh, 64 is Four blocks, sure. Five blocks, okay. Five blocks. So five blocks will be stored in different slave machines. Slave machines are what? Data nodes, right? Data nodes. So all this information is stored where? It is. It is stored. A uh, metadata, metadata information is stored in name node. Name node is again a one machine, and these are all again a single point of failure. Right? You can have a secondary name node. They are again a different concept altogether. But the idea is. So instead of storing the entire file in a single machine, so you store it in n number of machines. So for us, it is one my, one file. So for, for me, it is one data.csv. I want to process the data.csv. Internally, Hadoop is smart enough to break down that file into blocks. So this is uh, three blocks which is stored. You assume that it's 130 MB and which is stored in three blocks. So if, why it is stored in three blocks? Because the block size is 64 MB. So if the, I, I, I can increase the block size 
according to myself, I, according to my convenience. So I can I need to configure in some XML files of Hadoop. So for me, it is only one file. It is stored in three different machines. You can say this is one rack and this is one rack. This is one rack is so even if the entire rack goes down, so you, you can get the data that is called replications in Hadoop. So by default, it is three replication, and then you can customize according to yourself based on your need. This is the HDFS Hadoop distributed file system. This is called storage. So in, instead of storing in one machine, what what Hadoop suggests? So you store in ten machines. The data is stored in ten machines. And how do you process the data? On what mechanism? MapReduce, right? So earlier you used to write a normal uh, centralized system, which can be a Java application or .NET application. So which is to take the data, which is to read data from only one machine. Now the MapReduce, the job of the MapReduce is to process uh, data which are stored in ten machines parallelly. That's the beauty of MapReduce. So how uh, a traditional approach works and how MapReduce works both are different. So four or five people are working together to process your data. So if I, instead of working one person, if four or five persons, four or five persons are working parallelly, so obviously uh, work will be done fast, right? That's how the MapReduce. That's how the uh, MapReduce and Hadoop came. So this is a distributed system of uh, storage system. So what MapReduce suggests? Any doubts here? No right? No doubts in HDFS. So what MapReduce suggest? So I, let's assume that this is a big file of 130 MB. Assume that. It's not a big file, but assume that one th it's a big file of 130 MB. So block size is 64 MB. How many blocks will be there? Three blocks. So three blocks have to process parallel right? So how, how do you process the data? By using MapReduce, so three blocks has to process parallelly. It's not sequentially; it's a parallelly. But again, in in each block, that executed sequentially. Correct. So now, what happens? This is block one, block two, block three. This is 138, 130 MB file. Block size is 64 MB. So for me, it is only one file, data or CSV or any file. But internally, how it is stored? It is stored in three blocks. Why three blocks? Because Block size is 64 MB and then my file size is 130 MB. So for each block, one split will happen. That is called the input split. For each input split, one mapper you will launch. Again, you can customize according to yourself. You can increase the block size or you can increase the input size. So this is a very this is a question. You can like, how many mappers should be launched on what basis? So you can say for each input split, one mapper is launched. So by default, by default, so for each block, there will be one input split. You can customize according to yourself again, right? So for for each block, you can say for each block, one mapper is launched. Internally, for each input split, one mapper is launched. So if my block size is 100 MB, okay, and if I need to launch a mapper, so I need to configure what I need to configure input split also. So so that one mapper is launched for one block. Got it right? For one block, one mapper is launched. Internally, how it happens? Internally. Input split. It is based on the input split. So, if somebody asks how, uh, how many mappers are launched for your file, so you can say it is based, based on the input split. So, I can customize myself. If I want to uh, launch mapper for uh, 200 MB, each mapper for 200 MB, I need to change the my block size is 64 MB. But I want to launch a mapper for 100 MB each file, so I need to customize input split. Okay? But by default, all the configurations are with respect to block size. So for each block size, one mapper is launched. So what is happening here? So I'm just reading the data from the HDFS. This is HDFS. Again, this is HDFS. What I'm doing, I'm just reading the data from HDFS. So for each input split, one mapper is launched. OK, that is called input split. Oh, sorry. For each block, one mapper is launched. That is called input split, input split, input split. This is a workload logic. So what I'm doing, I write my code. This is my code, which is written by my. And again, this is my code, which is written by developer. Developer or MapReduce developer or Hadoop developer. So now uh, input split is happening. Now uh, what I do map in the mapping mapping phase, what I'm doing, I'm just taking the lines, all the lines, and uh, and then splitting the words, lines into words, and then assigning one to each word. What I'm doing? Cursor is not coming. Okay. Just a minute. Thank 
that is right now clear so clear right so if i specify three three register how many partitions sir three so one register will copy one partition one more. so that is called hashing internally it is called partitioning you can write your own partition that is called custom partition internally it uses default partition so how that is used it is called hashing mechanism by using equal equals and hash code method of java so for each object we generate a unique number so all the unique numbers will be put into one one partition all the unique number will be put into one partition all the unique number will be put into one partition for example here you can see here so all these will come into this bucket how that will come by using partition all the system will come to this place all the db will come to this place all the ri will come to this place how that will happen that's an upper output right how that will happen by using a default partitioning so this i somebody may ask you in an interview or somewhere where you are how can i write i i want to make sure that this should go to this register how will i do that so you have to write your own custom partitioner that you should implement your own hash code and uh, equals method what is right so what i am doing again i am just at the end i am just uh, uh, at the register i am just aggregating all the uh, map output and just writing it so during this process this is called one iteration during this process how many times i am reading and how many times i am writing and the reading here correct from the and the reading from the hashes that is input then i uh, do some logic in a mapper then again write i will write it to mapper mapper output so one read again one write again register starts copying mapper output and ready again then register writes it. so how many reads how many writes two reads two writes i'll i'll explain once again so mapper input is in hashes mapper starts processing by reading the data right so it reads the data again mapper reads the data to its local machine that is again a write right so one read one write so again register starts copying that is again a read right again register starts checking that is that's again a write so for each iteration that is for a map and reduce how many reads and how many writes two reads and two writes one is the reading into mapper reads and mapper writes okay register reads and register writes so during this process what happens so whenever i want to read the data i have to deserialize it so jvm understands everything in the form of objects jvm is nothing but java virtual machine so but i write when i write a to a disk i will serialize and write it so what i do when i reading and i am reading i need to deserialize it when i am writing again i have to serialize it so if you know serialization deserialization concept so when i am writing to a disk input is what hdfs so it's actually disk right but i will process the data in ram but i need to deserialize it if i want to process when i want to write it, how do i write i cannot write it as an object i have to serialize and write it okay so how many serialization how many deserialization four right two to serialization two deserialization that is what the problem with the map reduce so for each other let's just imagine most of the machine learning algorithm they are iterative in nature iterative in the sense they will run and run again and again 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 so for each iteration two serialization two serialization two deserialization so if i want to uh, run a map my machine learning algorithm so for each iteration how many serialization how many deserialization 60 so can we know 60 sure Two serialization, two serialization, right? Two iteration means 60 serialization, 60 serialization. So for one iteration, two reads, two writes, right? So two times serialization, two times serialization. So for 30 times, so it will be 60, 60, right? So just imagine if I want to process for 100 times, so how many times I have to serialize and serialize? Serialization, deserialization are heavy weight actually. So you have to convert everything in the form of byte stream. That is called serialization. So if you um, when you go home, you can. the uh, real world relation deserialization more in detail this is what the problem that map produces a lot of io io is mean input output operations i am reading i am again writing that is called io so the relation deserialization concept all together is a problem with the map produces though it is very fast so during uh, 2 3 years back so now this is the people are thinking okay this is this is there is parallel processing but it is slow why well, because relation deserialization ios That is the reason. That is the problem that map produces. So any doubt? You know, so we understood why. What is the traditional system? How traditional system works? How uh, 
how the Hadoop works, how HFS works, how MapReduce works. Any doubts here? No doubt. So if you have any doubts, you can interrupt me at any time. No doubt. Yes, performance, yes. And also see, performance in the sense work, serialized and deserialized. And also, iOS. Reads. Reads, yes, yes. And also, when you want to write, write, you replication is also a major factor here. So when you want to write, you replicate it to three different machine right? That's also a major factor. So if I want to, if I want to do any, any, anything on output of this, if, let's say I want to uh, get only these now. So what I have to do? Again, I have to write a map to the job. That is right. Let me tell you one more time. So let's say this is the output, right? B, I, if you see the final result, there is something like beer and car. So let's say I want to take only the words which are, which are, which, which count is more than three. One more time. See, I want to get the output. I want to get the only words which are, whose count is more than three. What is that word? Here is the car. So, but again, what do I have to do? Again, map to job is right. That is again called one more iteration. So, one more iteration in the sense what? Two more, two times read and two times write. Two times simulation, two times dissimulation. Again, when I write, I have to replicate again to three different machines. So, if you want to do some more analytics on, on top of that output, again, I have to write normal. That is called map to chaining. It is called map to chain, chaining. So, this is what the problem with the map to Got it right? So, limitations are not reduced. So, this is called one iteration and this is called one more iteration. So, what I am doing in, the, in, 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 in each iteration, I am doing mapping and reducing. In between, shuffling will come. During mapping, I will read the data and I will write the data to local machine. During addition, I will copy from the mapper output. Again, I write it after this. So, during that process, a lot of simulation and deceleration will happen. So, most of the <coughs> machine learning algorithm, they are iterative in nature. So, it takes a lot of time to work on map reduce architecture in a machine learning world, a normal, normal web application world, a normal uh, data engineer role also. So this is also one, one more example for each iteration I write to HDFS. So I take the, I read the data from HDFS that is called input when I do an iteration. For example, I did a word count. Then I write it to HDFS. Again, I want the words whose uh, count is more than four or five. Then, uh, then again, I have to write a mapped job. Then I, again one more iteration. So that's what the problem with the map is. Even if I want to query, for example, this is the example you think of hive. So when hive model, we write queries, right? Internal again it uses map uh, paradigm. So now what I'll, I'll, if I want to get the result by using query, I have to hit to uh, HDFS and I get the result. Again I want to read, get some more query, I want to get some more result, again I have to hit to HDFS and I'll get the result. That's how map works. That's where, uh, one more thing, if I want to develop any analytical framework, end-to-end -end analytical framework in Hadoop, end-to-end -end analytical framework means, in a sense, so if I want to have a batch processing, you understand that batch processing, which will be run at particular time by using cron job or by using a zookeeper or scoop, uh, by using any uh, automation tool. So I, I write a map reduce uh, for a batch processing. So if I want to, if I want to have real-time analytics, for example, uh, Twitter analytics, so, tweets are flowing. Somebody is talking about uh, something. You can say Narendra Modi. So, he is the Prime Minister. He went somewhere. So, then he, there are most of the people that are talking about. We want to do analytics. Where are the people who want to talk? How many counts are there? So, what are the top trends which are going on? Top tweets which are going on? So, you want to do real time. Facebook, and you want to collect the sensor data on real time. So, for example, IoT related application which will collect the sensor data on real time you want to do. So, you have to integrate with a storm. So, you have to install storm, Apache storm. So to collect a real-time data. So if I want to, if I want to have a SQL related, I, I don't want to write any code, I want to write ad hoc queries, I want to do group by and all, it's very difficult in uh, MapReduce, so I want to write ad hoc queries, then I have to install Hive. If I want to do machine learning, I have to have Mahout, machine learning algorithm, most of the machine learning algorithm in the big data world, Mahout, any, any machine learning, you know, you understand the machine learning concept, right? So for example, uh, I'll tell you, hmm, uh, which example I should, okay. So in, in your mail, uh, you have a spam category, right? Spam mail, so for example, how you earn 100, 100 rupees or 100 crore rupees, please share your contact. So which bucket it should go? Spam, right? Why? Why, how should it go? 
I mean, uh, is there a is there a person who is sitting and who is checking each and every mail and putting into spam category? No, right? It's not a manual task, right? So there has to be some mechanism or there has to be some algorithm which is running at the back end, which will read the mail and then put into spam. So that's one example of machine learning. It's a basic example of machine learning. So recommendation. So you and me are friend, and you both are friend, but I am not friend of his. So it starts recommending Facebook, starts recommending me, right? So that's also one example. But internet uses graph. Then I'll talk about it. So one recommendation, when, whenever you go, uh, any, you want to purchase something in e-commerce website, so Amazon or Facebook or, or Flipkart or any eBay or any e-commerce website, so it starts recommending you. People who bought this also bought this. That's also an example of machine learning you can think of. So these are the machine learning algorithms. Most of the machine learning algorithms, they are iterative in nature. MapReduce is very uh, heavy for them. So because of civilization and distillation. So you have to install Mahout if you want to have a uh, machine learning related stuff. So Mahout internally works, um, it uses MapReduce. So MapReduce again, it has a lot of problems. So what are the problems, sir? Yes, yes. And also, sir, please, he's oh, oh, writing. So what are the other problems with MapReduce? What are the other problems with the MapReduce? Serialization, deserialization, other IOs, right? IOs. Replications and also one more thing is that so you have everything you have to think of so if you have done a MapReduce coding so you should you will always think of uh, key value pairs what will be the mapper input what will be the mapper output so what will be the register input what will be the register output you are bound to think in that way so if there is no other option so if you want to do group by so you, you have to think okay what will be the input key for a mapper and what will be the mapper output and then register input and register output. So you have to think, always you have to think in that way. That is the one more problem also map produce. So you are, you, are, you are bound to think in that way. So, but if I want to have a network framework, so I need to take care of all this stuff. Again, if I want to do any graph testing, again, you have to install graph. I told you, right, that Facebook example. So that's the connection between, uh, it's a edge between you and me. Since you are friend of him and he is friend of mine, so we both are not friends. So what it does, Facebook uses internally a uh, graphing mechanism to connect between uh, nodes to have a edges. So this kind of thing you want to process. So you have to install Giraffe and there are a lot of other uh, graph processing, databases and processing engines. So this is what MP and analytical framework if you want to have, if you are, if you are working on Hadoop or MapReduce, so you need to install all these things. Okay, this is the one more problem with the MapReduce. So internally it uses MapReduce paradigm, right? So how you also use MapReduce paradigm internally, and now also use MapReduce. This is the biggest uh, problem. You need to have installed separate all these things separately, and you should have a separate resources. Resources in the sense it can be a normal person or it can be any systems. You should have all these are processes. You need to maintain all these things. And also if you want to <coughs> integrate with this with this, and it's a very challenging. And uh, high with the uh, uh, high with the uh, I with Mahout or uh, Giraffe, any other things if you want to integrate, it's very challenging because they both are independent. So that's why the problem with the traditional analytical tools. This is how we can say that traditional people used to have this kind of framework uh, two, three years back. So if you want to, they want to develop end-to-end -end big data analytical framework. So they used to have this kind of thing two, two years back. So got it right? I think I'll set now for the Spark. So you got it, what is the problem with the filter architecture? Uh, you also got it, uh, what is the problem uh, with the, uh, you know, I mean, how do, how do you distribute uh, data into a distributed machine? How do you process uh, by using parallel processing engine called MapReduce? And what is the problem with the MapReduce? Right? Now let's see, what is Spark then? Now what is Spark? So it's a processing engine. It's like you can say it's a replacement to MapReduce. It's a processing engine to process huge amount of data. Right? So it is not a replacement to Hadoop, but it is a replacement to MapReduce. Got it right? And you are not bound to think in the form of in the in, in the form of QL pairs. There are a lot of options which are available in the uh, Spark or uh, you can play with easily with the data set. It's a processing you need to process huge amount of data. And also it is called an infer stack. So I told you, right, if I want to develop an analytical framework in Hadoop, so what I think, if I want to do SQL related stuff, what I need to install? If I want to do in Hadoop, in Hadoop, if I want to do analytic, if I want to do SQL, 
So what I need to install? Hive, right? So here is Spark SQL. Now you need to install separate Hive. So if you want to do real-time analytics in Hadoop, what I need to install? Apache Storm, right? So no need to install Apache Storm. Spark string does the real-time analytics. If you wanted to do machine learning in Hadoop, so what I have to install? Mahmood. No need to install Mahmood. ML is there. So if you want to do any graph processing, graph is to use to install knowledge the graphics. So there are other packages also you can integrate with easily with the Cassandra, uh, NoSQL database. There are a lot of third party packages which Spark provides. So you can easily integrate with the third party systems. So and also if I want to code in MapReduce, what are the programming language I have? Java and Python also you can code it, you can write the code in. But when it comes to Spark, so you can code it in Scala. That's actually programming plus functional language. And you can also code in Java. If you're familiar with Java, you can also code it in Python. Most of the data scientists, they code in Python and R if they want to open with data analytics. So and also, when, when MapReduce reads read the data from where? It reads only from HDFS. Only from HDFS. So, but when it comes to Spark, it reads from Hadoop HDFS, it can also read from Cassandra, it can also read from Hive, it can also read from HBase, which is like in a NoSQL database on top of HDFS. It can also read data from uh, relational database, example Postgres, or Oracle, or MySQL, any relational database, it can read. And it can also read data, uh, JSON data, MySQL data, Elasticsearch. This is an, this is an end-to-end end to end thing which has everything for you to develop a big data analytical platform or big data analytical application if you want to develop if you want to develop and also you can easily integrate SQL with streaming streaming with machine learning machine learning with SQL all these things you can easily play with and you can apply your logic you can combine all the logic and you can work on so which is actually very faster this is what the spark so got it right what is spark what is Spark, sir? MapReduce. So it's, the, it's a processing engine. It's a distributed processing engine. So you can also call it as an analytical framework to process a huge amount of data. When I say analytical framework, you can have all these things. What other things you can have? You can have a Spark SQL to, process, to play around with SQL queries. You can have a streaming to uh, pull the data from real-time analytics to take the data from uh, Twitter, Facebook, or sensor data. So on, on, on fly you want to do some analytics, you can play with the machine learning algorithm. A lot of machine learning algorithm are there. Most of the data centers they use machine learning algorithm. So more graphics, if you want to have a graph data processing packages. And also it takes the data from different sources. From uh, JSON, you can read a JSON file or you can read the data from Postgres database or any other SQL databases. This is what is the Spark. Very right? Any doubt here? So you can process what type of data? Structure, any, any type of data. Any type. It can process uh, semi-structured data, structured data. It can process images. It can process videos. Well, whatever you want. So it can collect the sensor and then it can you can process huge amount of data. The only thing is you have to have a uh, different systems. Again, you, you can integrate with Kafka. Kafka is actually a distributed machine queue system. So you can have a you can collect the sensor data in Kafka and Kafka and Spark can be easily integrated. You can do real-time analytics. So, it's a big data analytical framework. What do you write? Including... That's what I told, right? Where you can write it code in Scala. I it is written Java, Python, RR. Since it is developed by using Scala programming language, this framework is... MapReduce is... Or Hadoop is developed by using Java. Internally, Hadoop is a framework, right? Which is developed by using Java programming language. But Spark is developed by using Scala programming language. So, so you can most of the algorithms or most of the features or whenever they release new API application program interface, they release in Scala first because it is developed in Scala. So Scala and Spark is the best combination. But you can, if you are familiar with Java, you can work on Java because they have exposed Java API. You can easily work with Java. If you are familiar with Python, you can work with Python. If you are familiar with R, you can easily work with R. Any any other doubts? No, I guess, right? Okay, let's see. This is the definition. Let's see how it works, how it is working internally. 
So what is happening? So for each iteration, what I'm doing, I used to, in a MapReduce, for each iteration, what I'm doing, in what I used to do, in a MapReduce, for each iteration, I used to write a data to disk. Right? So what for the rest, don't write the intermediate result. That is called intermediate result. For example, if I want to do, uh, if I, I get a word count, then I got the result. On top of that word count result, I want to get only the words which are, which whose length is or whose count is more than 10. Then what I have to write again? Again, I have to write a map logic, right? Correct? You can, you can do the same thing with single iteration also, but it is not feasible. I'll write a map logic job. Again, I'll write one more map logic job. So what I'm doing, I'm just writing the intermediate result to this. After I write each iteration, I did one iteration, I write out this. Then from there again I read. Again, I, there will be input split. Again, there will be a mapper logic. Again, mapper MS to local machine, reducer starts copying, and then reducer writes the output to disk. So what path is it? Don't store it in intermediate result to input disk. So rather you store it in a distributed RAM. Important thing is here, it's a distributed RAM. That's only really the important thing. So I'm not writing to disk. I'm keeping the intermediate result in a distributed RAM. If I have a data or intermediate result in a distributed RAM, if I want to get a uh, words which are more than, or occurrence which are more than 10, so I can easily apply logic and which can be, a, which makes, you know, processing faster, right? That is the beauty of Spark. So, in the mapper days, there is no other option. You cannot apply mapper logic again on top of reducer logic. Reducer is emitted the data, it's the implemented result. You cannot apply mapper onto it. So, you have to write it again, then you have to apply logic, mapper logic. So, you cannot write a mapper logic or uh, map code and output of map uh, reducer. So reducer has to write the data to disk. That is the problem. So but here, so after each operation, what I'm doing, I'm storing it in distributed RAM. That's important. A lot of concept behind it. A lot of concept in a lot of concept. A lot of doubts will come. So my RAM size is less. How do I do? A lot of things are in that. But it's very important. But Spark is smart enough to do all this stuff. So whatever you do, let's say my machine is small. I don't, I don't have that much RAM. So how do you, how the how the Spark shows? But let's say I have 100 GB file, how the Spark shows into 100 GB file. But there are a lot of challenges, but Spark is smart enough to handle all those kind of challenges. So it's a, not a RAM, it's a single machine RAM, it's a distributed machine RAM. If I have three machines, three machines RAM will be combined to process your data. That's the beauty of Spark. No, 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 that's that, that, that I told you, right? that, is not, that is not the concept. That you know, there, are, there are a lot of concepts behind it. So we will not store entire uh, entire data into distributed RAM. That will, we, will, we will process again. Even, even the map reduce, what it does, map reduce process in the RAM. But the problem is right to this lot of solution. If you want to have a 10 TB of data to process in Spark, there's a different concept altogether. So even if you don't have that much of disk, uh, that much of RAM, it tries to disk. But it is still 10 times faster. Here you can see here. So if your data is in RAM, it is 100 times faster than MapReduce. But if your data is, let's say you don't have RAM, that much RAM available. But still, it is 10 times faster because of uh, lazy evaluation of RDD. I'll, tell, I'll talk about that uh, today or tomorrow. And lazy evaluation of RDD and uh, directory aesthetic graph, lineage graph, and there are a lot of concepts behind it. So, but it is still, if you are writing entire data to disk, still it is 10 times faster than MapReduce. That is why most of the people, they are moving towards Spark. So if the people who are, like, if the people who are working on map they still, if they, they, they don't want the performance, they don't want the speed, they, they are just working, then that's fine. But if they want the result in seconds, they should, there is no other option, you should go with the Spark. So that's what the beauty of Spark. So instead of storing in one machine, or instead of storing the intermediate result in a disk, what I'll do, I'll store it in a distributed RAM. So then I'll, that makes the processing faster than MapReduce. So any other doubt? No other side? Right? So let's, let's see the difference. I told you, right, it's a not replacement to it is not replacement to Hadoop, it is a replacement to MapReduce. Let's say uh, I want to, I want to do uh, a comp comparison between MapReduce and uh, Spark. So MapReduce storage is a disk only. 
there is no other way but you can store it in ram and also the disk and there are only two operations in uh, mapreduce operations are called methods so you can whatever you need to think you have to pick in the form of map and reduce i told it and in the method you what is the key and what is the what is the mapper input what will be the key what will be the value again you have to pick up mapper output what will be the key that i am going to emit from the mapper and what will be the value again you have to think in the reducer also what will be the key and what will be the value but so you have to you are bound to think in that way but here you have a lot of operations you can join you can do a lot of operations with respect to a spark which i am going to talk a later the execution mode is a batch is the batch interactive and streaming streaming is the real time analytics uh, interactive means i am just interacting with the shell so programming language java and python they are not mentioned python here so java and python you can do it in uh, mapreduce but uh, you can in when it comes to spark you can do it in scala java or python thank you just to know Spark is a processing engine. It's also called as a unified stack. Why it is called as a unified stack? So if I wanted to process any uh, SQL type stuff, no need to install Hive. Spark SQL serves the purpose. If I wanted to do real-time analytics, what I have to install? What I have to install sir in Hadoop? If I want to do real-time analytics on Twitter data, in Hadoop what I have to install? Storm, right? Apache Storm is the one which does real-time analytics in Hadoop. So if you want to do machine learning, machine learning, Mahu to have installed it. So that's all. But when it comes to a Spark, so it has everything. It has an ML, which can do a machine learning, which can SQL, which can do a Spark high-related stuff, uh, high-related SQL, which is can write a query and streaming. And Spark R is the again, which is actually you can integrate with the R. Everything is internally converted into a Spark core code. In, when you write high query, how do you internally what happens? Listen here, please. When when you write high query, what happens internally? When I write select start from particular table or uh, I do group by anything. So internally what happens? How the execution is it? Map reduce, right? Internally it generates a mapper and then a reducer. Lot of things are there. So in, everything is converted into Spark core here. So high is just a wrapper on top of map reduce. So it's again a framework which we are developed on top of MapReduce, which you feel like you are writing SQL code, but internally it is generated, which it is generated in MapReduce. So even if I want to develop a machine learning algorithm, if I want to work on machine learning algorithm, so I, what I, in Hadoop, what I now to use, right? So internally when I write any machine learning algorithm, internally it is MapReduce. So this is one way you can think of. It's a Spark code is the one which is internally every, all the code, the Spark to is just a wrapper on top of Spark code, so which is a real-time analytics. And then, Yes, Spark is still the wrapper on top of SQL. So on top of Spark code, which is which is uh, to get the queries. MLOP is the machine learning. Uh, graphics is the graph interpretation. Spark is the integrated script of Spark. So the beauty the beauty of Spark is here. So you can you can you can integrate all these things. You can you can integrate Spark with SQL with streaming, and Spark code with SQL, and MLOP with graphics. Anything. The beauty is here. 
to utilize here. When you want to do, uh, when I want to introduce uh, uh, machine uh, Spark uh, SQL with high with some other stuff, it is very challenging actually. So if you want to integrate the MapReduce with some other some other so open source framework, it's very challenging. So the beauty lies here, the Spark beauty lies here. You can easily combine the functionality of all the things in one line. In one line, I can combine all the stuff. For example, I have a table. Uh, I have a table of employees. Okay, I do group by. For example, employee one, uh, my January salary is uh, some some dollar, February salary is some dollar. So if I do group by on employee, what happens? I'll get the all all the as a list. I'll get right for a particular employee. Very right. So that I want to see the difference, difference between all uh, the list. Uh, if I do group by on particular column, I'll get the list. Right for a key, I'll get the list. So I want to apply some logic on top of this. I can apply max, min. All these things are there in SQL. Let's say I want to compare. I want to take the difference between next element and present element. So how do I do that? Where, where is that? But I want to see. I want to see the difference. For example, I, I have an employee, and I get his salary, all the salary as a list. Okay. Now if I do max, max is function there. So which is the month we got the max salary? Got it. Min salary is there. Average salary is there because all these functions are there in SQL. For example, I want to get the difference between first month and second month. Call it right. Second month and third month. So what is the increment we got? I want to do this kind of logic. So in that case, I have to write my own logic, right? If I want to do it in Java and Hive, I have to write my own UDF. That is called user defined function. I have to write a Java code and then I have to register that UDF and I can use that function in Hive. But when you come to Spark, you can integrate. So what, I'm, what are you doing in Hive? So you are integrating Java with Hive. That you have to create a jar and then you have to add that. But the beauty of Spark, you can you can convert that uh, uh, list to the right. You can convert that into RDD, that's actually a Spark code, and then you can write your own logic. So you can move, write a for loop and then you can iterate, iterate through the list and you can write a comparison. That's actually pretty easy. For example, for i is equal to one to layer the length of that and then you can just do a difference. Next element, plus minus present element. Very right. So this is how you can do and you can combine the functionality. Functionality of Spark, what I, what I did, I did a functionality of Spark core and Spark SQL I combined. For example, I want to, I am getting a real-time data, sensor data. I want to register as a table and I want to select. So I want to do select start from. What I have to do? You have to integrate Spark stream with Spark SQL. It's pretty easy in Spark. Pretty easy. But when you want to do, in Hadoop it's very challenging. That's the beauty of Spark. So you can integrate uh, the functionality of all these uh, separate uh, wrappers and then you can work on. So you, 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 want, you want to do a machine learning with a Spark SQL, you can do easily. It's just a matter of one line code, that's it. So now coming to, coming to Spark. The Spark, the main abstraction is Spark. You understand abstraction, right? Abstraction is only concentrating on the functionality rather than concentrating on internal code. So the main abstraction in Spark is the ability. Resilient distributed data set. What is resilient, what is distributed, I'll talk about it later. But it's, you can think of the main abstraction. Spark is Spark is nothing but RDD. If you know RDD, then you know Spark. That's it. There is nothing in the Spark. But if you know RDD, that's it. You are done with Spark. But knowing in RDD is very challenging. Knowing in the functionality and how do you apply, where do you, all these things are very challenging. So what is RDD? An immutable distributed collection of data published by the cluster of machines. The data which is stored in a distributed RAM or distributed machine is called RDD. I'll tell you. For, for example, data.csv is a file. Format is one file. But that file is stored in three different machines. The data which is stored in a three different machine is called RDD. Format is only one data file, right? But internally it is stored in two different machines. So one part in one machine, one part in one machine, one part in one machine. Got it right? So one part is for 64 MB, the same thing you assume, the same thing is there basically. One part for 64 MB, one part for 64 MB, one part for, uh, what, let's say one part MB means 64, 64 and the remaining. So the data which is stored in a distributed machine or distributed RAM 
is called as an adhidu what is resilient what is resilient is so there is something called linear graph whenever the part let's say let's say i have a 64 mb 64 mb and the remaining mb if the part one part of the 64 mb is failed or some must that machine got crashed or something happened to that that machine that machine is not responding but my data is there in that so spark is smart enough to rebuild that data that is why it is called resilient how the tool is that is by using a linear graph by using a linear graph spark is smart enough to rebuild the partition of that add that is why it is called resilient what you write sir why it is distributed why it is distributed sir yeah. it's a resilient distributed data set right it's a distributed means the data is stored in different machine that is why it is distributed data set means data set why it is resilient so if the for example 64 mb 64 mb remaining mb my my file is 138 138 mb one file is stored in one machine one file is stored in one machine one file is stored in one machine if one part is failed mark spark is smart enough to rebuild that we no need to we no need to do all the stuff spark is smart enough spark is smart enough to rebuild that failed partition by itself by how by using linear graph there is something called linear graph by using linear graph and directed assembly graph spark is smart enough to rebuild that partition of data which is failed that is why it is called resilient once again so why it is called resilient why it is called resilient which is graph which can bring back the data by using linear graph so if the part of the data is failed if the entire data is failed you can again enter the spark is smart enough to rebuild entire data so let's assume that my part of the data is failed Spark is smart, spark is smart enough to rebuild. That is why it is called resilient. Distributed, distributed. If you understand this, how do you apply operations and all these? That is actually what the transformation. That's it. No, no, no. It doesn't make any no replica. That's the beauty of Spark. Automatically. So whenever the, it it fails, right? So why why generally why why we why we have replication? If one machine goes fail, then we can go into that machine. If there is nothing like that, so it knows where the data is there. From it, from the, let's say if entire machine goes down, then we cannot do anything. If entire memory is if entire cluster is down, then we cannot do anything. But Spark is smart enough to rebuild if the machine is there. If the machine knows. He will recreate everything. If the entire thing is gone, he will recreate everything from the scratch. Linear graph, linear graph. If if intermediate results are failed by using a linear graph, it spark is smart enough. The spark is smart enough to rebuild the entire stuff. That's the beauty of spark. So how do you create ID? Then, <coughs> so by using this. We forget about this. This is a spark context. This is a spark context. So value again keyword. We in a Scala we this is Scala code. Value keyword to create any object. Okay, like uh, any any object you can think of. Value or var. There are two two things we can create. Value is immutable. Value is a var is immutable. What I mean, I'm just creating value added is called to S C dot parallelize. So S C is what S C is a spark context. So this is this is entry point to spark. Which is entry point to Spark. Let's use the Spark context. By default, if you are working with Spark shell, it will create for you Spark. If you are developing your own application, you have to create your own Spark context. Let's use the Spark context, which is entry point to Spark. Then parallelize the method, which is to create an ID. Let's use the parallel list of one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can think of it's an ID. So for me, it is one one list. But intermediate is stored in two machines. Parallelize. That's what I told you. Val is a keyword, so to create any variable or object. R D is the name, so you can give your own any name. So then equal to Spark context. So see this Spark context. And then parallelize is the method to create an R D. Then I am just passing the list. For me, it is one list. Intermediate is stored in two machines. If I have two partition, let's say I want to process parallelly, so I'll store it in two machines. I can apply operations on two machines possible. 
So for me, it is only one list. Internally, it can store it in a number of machines. Got it right? So this is how we create a RDD. We'll, we'll have a lot of operations on RDD. Well, correct. But if you can think of, there are two ways I can create RDDs. The two, two, three ways, but I'll show you two ways. One is a text file. I see the text file. So if I want to read the file, readme.md, once again here, so readme.md, let's say readme.md is 150 MB. Okay, so block size is 64. So how many map are you going to do? 3 by block for each block or input with one map are you Now here you can think of the same way. So how many, let's say block size is 64. Okay, so now I launch a, I, I create RDD. So how many partitions will be created? With B log, B log, it's okay, even if you tell wrong, it's not a problem, right? So yeah, three. Why three? For each block, one partition will be created. That is called RDD. That's it. Very right? One partition by default. Internally, you can assume the same way. You can customize according to yourself again. Internally, it contacts main mode. This uh, is the text team. It's called as an Hadoop Adir. Internally, there is an, one more concept called Hadoop Adir. Contacts main mode to see where this file is stored and how many blocks are there. So, her main mode has all this info. So, how many blocks are there for this file where the data is stored? Okay, block 1, block 2, block 3, which is stored in node 1, node 2, node 3. Okay, then on top of this, spark rates. That's the RAM. Then it is called, for me, it is only one reading that only. But internally, it is a tree partition. Got it right? Distributed. The data is distributed. A3 different machine. Resilient. I'll talk about that resilient later. But you understood, right? Resilient, it can be able automatically. I see that text file, which is on parallels of the two models that I can create a RDD. There are here again. Uh, you can have a, if I want to read a file from a dear directory, you can have your own, uh, you, you, you can have a, a whole text info file formatter and all how you input formatters supported with Spark. How do input formatters something like key value, sequence file, uh, ML input formatter, sequence input file formatter, a lot of text input formatter is going to default. So a lot of input formatter which are all supported with Spark also. So how do you create RDDs? Let's see parallels and let's see that text file. Let's see the Spark context. This is actually entry point to Spark. So if I have, it, let's say, uh, let's 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 uh, discuss words out. So if I, I'm reading this time. Okay, uh, this is stored in three blocks, right? So 130 MB of file zone, but this block size is 64 MB and three blocks. So uh, it is stored in node one, node two, node three. Okay, the replicas are stored in node four, node five, node six. No one, no. Right? Just. Uh, Hadoop in HDFS I'm talking about. For whatever spark I have now, I have a file written by Tandy which is stored in HDFS. Node 1, Node 2, Node 3 are the blocks where the actual file is stored. 64 MB, 64 MB and the remaining. But the replicas are stored in different nodes. Node 4, Node 5, Node 6, I assume. So let's spark started. Okay, uh, Node 1, Node 2, Node 3. Okay, now uh, Node 1, it is doing some operation, then it did some operation. And then it did some more operations. Spark started everything is done. All of a sudden, node 1 goes down. Okay. Node, go, node goes down. Enter node goes down. So Spark needs to rebuild, right? That partition of the How do it rebuilds? It is always in sync with the main node. So what is that main node contains? Block 1 is replicated here one more place. Node 4. Node 4 is replicated in node 4. So Spark is part enough to launch its RAM where and node 4. That is where this is called Linux. That is internally it prepares all the stuff. That is where it is smart enough. So Spark always in sync with main node. So it is a headache of main node to have all this application all. Spark is headache in all this. Spark is always smart enough. So if the entire machine goes down, so Spark is smart enough to contact main node and get the, where is that replica stored. So it is stored in Another node, what are the computations which it has done, it will automatically do. For example, I read a filter or I read a group by, <coughs> let's 
ఇంకో ఐ ఐ రీడ్మీ రీడ్మీ డాట్ ఎన్బి సో రీడ్మీ డాట్ ఎన్బి ఐ వాంట్ టు డూ వర్క్ అవుట్ సో వాట్ ఆర్ దాట్ ఇంటర్మీ త్రీ పార్టిషన్స్ వర్క్ కౌంట్ విల్ బి దట్ త్రీ పార్టిషన్స్ రైట్ వన్ పార్టిషన్ థర్డ్ పార్టీ సెకండ్ పార్టీ థర్డ్ పార్టీ త్రీ పార్టిషన్స్ వర్క్ అవుట్ డౌన్ దెన్ ఐ వాంట్ టు డూ ఐ వాంట్ టు గెట్ ఎన్ వర్డ్స్ విచ్ ఆర్ మోర్ విత్ త్రీ లెంత్ సో నౌ ఆన్ టాప్ ఆఫ్ దట్ అవుట్ పుట్ అగైన్ ఐ డూ సమ్ సమ్ మోర్ లాజిక్ దెన్ త్రీ పార్టిషన్స్ ఆర్ దర్ ఇట్ స్టిల్ త్రీ పార్టిషన్స్ ఆర్ దర్ సో ఐ విత్ టూ ఆపరేషన్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద ఆపరేషన్స్ వన్ ఇస్ వర్క్ అవుట్ అండ్ వన్ ఇస్ ద లెంత్ విచ్ వర్డ్స్ విచ్ ఆర్ లెంత్ మోర్ మోర్ దెన్ టెన్ అజ్ ఇన్ దట్ ఐ ఐ విత్ టూ ఆపరేషన్స్ నా సో లెట్స్ అజ్ ఇన్ దట్ వన్ పార్టిషన్ స్టేల్ so it has to do two operations right so it will contact my node and get the get the data again from the scratch and it applies the same logic to that partition only to that partition that is why it is called resilient distributed data set so now here is a architecture of spark works so let's say i have a this is a master job tracker you know right you guys know job tracker job tracker is the master to uh, launch job right to to whom you submit a job to like i want to process data dot csv i want to do work on a data dot csv to whom you submit a job ha uh, we submit a job right i want to process this i want to do work on okay we you can submit the job i want to process particular job particular csv i'll submit to him job tracker internally job tracker what it does tracker internally it contacts the main node where the data is there <coughs> internally it contacts main node right internally it contacts main node where the data is there because i from me to get a csv but where the data is stored where is that information the job tracker doesn't know right so he has to ask task tracker and where the data is there so it will contact main node then what it does it launches the map it again to contact the node and it gets the where the data is there it is still less than the node one node two node three and then in the block one block two block three then where it, what it does it tells task tracker to go and launch map task and edit task at data node one data node two data node three okay if the data node one is busy or machine is busy so it launches in some other machine right so you know this concept i hope <coughs> let's assume that my machine is busy doing some other task from the other side but i want to, but my data is the, in that machine but some other machine is free so what it does the map pass and also it starts copy to that machine it processes so that's a very interesting concept but where the data is there there only map pass and data will be launched most of the time that is called data locality if you are you know, go back home and you read about data locality it's very important concept got it right so now as in the third way so it's a it's a master we do work notes are the slave notes in a spark work notes are the same as in the diesel the ram on top of this on the data node we are working work notes i submit a job to master or i write a, a master value here so everything is here driver spark driver then i submit a job to cluster manager the job of the cluster manager is to set the resource availability and produce the job for each person separate separate memory will be allocated right? for example i have a 100 node cluster 10 people are working 10 people should be isolated with each other right to process their job so what happens this is the job of the cluster cluster manager cluster manager can be yarn if you know yarn that's the map produced to the time the resource negotiator it can be a resource it can be a standalone so most of the time i we work on standalone and you can have a yarn and you can have a at other at resource so it's actually a resource negotiator to check the availability of the resources whether that can be launched or not launched since it is a ram right so it is it uses ram and all the machine is fully occupied and its machine is fully occupied to working with some other job so it has to check the resource availability and by checking the resource availability it has to launch the job so who is the master here spark driver is the master who is the slave worker or server slaves okay so you can assume that this is a job tracker and these are the task trackers assume that it's not that funny concept just assume <coughs> internally it has a task task is nothing but you can say map task and data task until it has executed then in the inside the executor it has map task and data task you can say you can assume that in that way so who is the master here spark driver is the master and then cluster manager what is the job of the cluster manager 
check the available of the resource, schedule the jobs, all these things. I'll contact the Spark Master, will contact the customer manager to submit a job. I want to submit a job, I want to process the job on a distributed machine. So, data stored here, data node, data node, data node. So, can anybody tell me how? Uh, okay, let me tell. So, my, my data is here, my data is here. Okay, I want to work on Spark. Okay, now, worker node will be launched here and here. How and what basis? You got it? Okay, you are not good. Okay, my data node, I have a file of 150 or whatever MB. Let's assume 100 MB. 64 MB, 64 MB. 64 MB stored, 64 MB stored here. And my processing will happen here only. Right? Data dot CSV is of 2 MB, uh, 100 MB, which is stored in two blocks. Where is it stored? Right? So now I, I, the processing will happen here itself. How the processing will happen here? On what basis? So Spark here internally contacts name node. Where it contacts name node? To know, no, 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 to know where the data is there. Block 1 is stored here, and block 2 is stored here. Got it, right? The block 1 is stored here, block 2, and on top of that, local node is launched. Why? Why so? It can launch here also, right? It will not launch here. Why? Because my data is here. That is called data locality. How that will happen? Because the driver manager, internal spark driver will contact main node to get where the data is there. Is it confusing over? Not right? A film CP? Okay. So, I have a block on block 2 showed here. Worker node is launched in block on block 2. Why? Because my data is stored there. So, who is the job? This guy This guy will tell to oh, customer manager that I want this worker node 1, worker node 2. Because my data is here. So, how will this guy will? This guy will contact internally to name node. And he will come to know where the data is stored. Name node will tell where the data is stored in data node 1, data node 2. And the question manager is the person who, who will check the resource availability of this machine, whether you can process the data or not. If that he is free, he, if he is free, if this machine is free, then he will allocate the resources to that guy. Then he can process the data. If they are free, then if, if they are not free, let's assume that these guys are not free, this machine, this machine is not free. It's like actually one machine. You can assume the Spark worker and Spark data node in one machine. On top of one machine, you have data node and the worker node. If that machine is busy doing some other job, so that worker node will be also in some other machine. Then it has to copy the data and we have to process it. That's actually heavyweight. So here, you are able to correlate with the job tracker and Spark, right? You are able to correlate with the map and Spark IS. You can assume that. Okay? So these are the master is Spark driver is a master. This is something that job tracker. So on top of that, where the data is there? There is that. That is called data locality. That's very, very important. Because it is a distributed environment, right? And the data, a lot of data will be there. Some data, it's a lot of data.
then you get the result. So RDDs are lazily evaluated. Lazily evaluated means when I apply an action, then only I will get the result. So during the job, right, during the job, I apply a lot of transformation. So I, get, I can filter out the result. Nothing will happen when I write something, through, something will spark out, nothing will happen until yes, I call an action. When I call an action, I will get the result. And also it starts executing the job. So it will contact uh, cluster manager, cluster manager reflects the resource availability and it starts executing. So RBD are lazily evaluated immutable collection of distributed data set. Why it is immutable? Because nobody wants to change the 30 GB of data, right? Nobody wants to update actually. So if I have a data of 30 partition in 4 or 5, nobody will update 30 GB data go and manually. It's not an easy task. So it's, you can say it is immutable, resilient, resilient means a fault tolerant, distributed, lazily evaluated. Lazily evaluated means when I apply transformation, nothing will happen. When I apply an action, then only starts, it starts, back starts executing. That's what the RED. We'll talk about that. We'll have an example tomorrow. We'll come to know what exactly. That's all. If you have any doubt, you can ask me. Nothing will happen in the RAM only. It just keeps that it has to do multiplication. For example, multiply each element by itself. I do a transformation. That is called transformation. I want to filter out it. I don't want to take the even numbers. I want to take the only odd numbers. What I do, I write with some logic. That is called transformation. Okay. So when I do action, when I did a transformation like filter, filter the even numbers. I want the odd numbers. Filter the even numbers. That is called transformation I apply. At the end, what I do, I call an action. When I do the filter right, I think that actually it has not been filtered. Not a filter. When I apply an action, then only it starts executing. That makes the spark faster. For example, if I want to go to Majestic, so what happens? If I want to go to Majestic, let's say uh, somebody says you go Martali here. You go Martali from there, you go to Majestic. So he will not tell where to go. First he will tell you go to Majestic. I don't know where I'm going. Okay. I'll go to Marathali. From Marathali, I'll go to Majestic. So what happens? Spark is smart enough. Somebody, somebody say, tells you that to go to Marathali, then go to Ma Majestic. That's how Java works. Spark is smart enough. I applied, I applied one transformation. What happens? One transformation is from uh, Silk Boat to Marathali. Marathali to, Marathali to, then again, Majestic. I apply one transformation and second transformation. That's how I applied. But Spark is, Spark is smart enough. So, since it is lazily evaluated, he will keep in mind that I need to go to Marathali. He will not go actually. Then he will think, okay, then from there again he has to go to, uh, from, uh, from Marathali again he has to go to Majestic. So, he will keep in mind, okay, I have to go to Marathali, Majestic. So, when I apply an action, when I go, click go, then he try to find the shortest path. He will not go to Marathali, he will not go to, he can directly go to, that makes the path faster. Again, it's one example, it's not an idle case. So it is a way to lazily evaluated I am talking about. Got it right? So it is lazily evaluated. Just remember that we are to go. Intermediate result will be steep and then that's how it is. That makes the spark 100 times faster than map reduce. Even if the data is not there in a the distributed RAM, but still it is 10 times faster because of all this lazy, uh, lazily evaluation, because of uh, uh, DAG, Meritor SV graph, to have a lineage graph. I hope that you understood why Spark people are moving towards Spark. Go, go home and check about Spark.
So tomorrow, I think it's a four-day class. So tomorrow, I'll, I'll talk about some examples. This example, how do you create RDD? What are the different transformation and actions for you apply in RDD? We'll go through those examples. And we can also integrate Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, basic examples. And then also, I'll also talk about machine learning, all those things in the Spark. Okay, and also how do you read that file data from a local file system, all those things. And then also, I'll talk about uh, some entry points, what are things you need to prepare if you're looking for a job in Big Data Analytics using Spark. So that's all all about. So if you guys have a laptop and all, it would be good if you can practice. Or I'll, I, I actually show it here. So I'll show with examples. And that's it, yeah. But tomorrow and after tomorrow, and I think three days, three more days to go. I 
Executor is JVM. So if data is stored here, right? Data is stored. You want to process data nodes. Data nodes. Data nodes. The name node is here. So you want to process the data. How do you process by using JVM? JVM by using processing JVM. These are the executors are the one data node. We need one executor. No, one worker node. For each person, you are also working on this. I am also working on this. So for one person, one executor. Inside this task, task are the threads. They are multi-threading. Multi-threading. Task are the multi-threading. Executor is one for one person, one executor. So this is to process the data. This is to store the data. One worker node will have uh, one, one data. This is part of the data. what it is. Okay, no issue. I'll give it to you. 